From Day Job to Dream Job with Carrie Oberbrunner. Well, this is an interview that you don't want to miss. In his book of the same title, Day Job to Dream Job, Carrie starts with these shocking statistics. 86% of employees plan to actively look for a new job in the upcoming year. Another 8% said they're already doing so and they're actively networking and only 5% intend to stay in their current position. So whether you're one of those people today actively looking for a transition in your career or you work with clients who are, I know you're going to be interested. We've interviewed authors and speakers addressing this from Michael Hyatt to Dan Miller to Michael Gerber and today we're really excited to have another prominent coach in that area Carrie Oberbrunner. Chris, tell our listeners a little bit about today's guest. I will do so, and we're very excited to be introducing him here. This is straight from his website. I'll give you a little blurb first and then a little personal note here. Carrie Oberbrunner left his day job to pursue his dream job. He calls it igniting souls. Through his writing, his speaking, his coaching, he helps individuals and organizations clarify who they are, why they're here, and where they should invest their time and energy. Sounds like a lot of coaching there, right? Gary struggled finding his own distinct voice and passion as a young man. He suffered from severe stuttering, depression, and even self-injury. Today, a transformed man, Gary invests his time helping others achieve their true potential. He's the founder of Redeem the Day, which serves the business community, and Igniting Souls, which serves the nonprofit community. He and his wife, Kelly are blessed with three amazing kids, and they live in Columbus, Ohio. That's actually not far from my stomping grounds. I grew up in Canton and Maslin, Ohio. But, Carrie, it's great to have you here today. Hey, it is great to be here, Chris and Kim. I can't wait to add value to your crew today. Well, thank you, man. I know that's going to happen. My, my initial actual connection with you was not through your writings or your speaking, although I had heard your name through some of the people that I run with. But instead, it was when you and Dan Miller joined forces on that uh, project you did. Was it last year, maybe a year and a half ago? No, Escaping you're right. Shawshank? Yep, August of 2015, Escaping Shawshank. And the name kind of hits exactly where it, where it is. I mean, it is literally at the place where they filmed the Shawshank Redemption. It's a metaphor that we'll probably speak about today. But yeah, we had um, several dozen people come and the first day was basically moving out of the prison that you find yourself in. It could be employment. It could be relational. But then the second day we spent at a place called Spark Space, which kind of represents life. And we had, you know, death one day, life the next. And we basically created plans for people to move out of that Shawshank experience that they have in their life. Well, man, I, I wasn't able to go, of course, but as you know, my son-in-law did go, and he was brand new married. He and our daughter, Alyssa, uh, made, I think, a very wise decision in investing their meager monies at the time, having just tied the knot the month before, to get him out there and, and carry the background on that. Uh, Rachel and I, my wife and I, raised our kids uh, with very much of an entrepreneurial mindset. Wow. They have seen daddy work from home all of their lives. That's all they know is mm. mom and dad are here. And that means we're portable and we homeschool the kids. So they trek all over the place. That's how they grew up. That is not how most people grew up. And so he was coming into this family, marrying into our family, <clears throat> Having seen how Alyssa was raised, mm. being very intrigued by it, loving the portability and the flexibility of what he saw here in our lifestyle, but saying, man, I just finished up a degree being a mechanical engineer. And, and, and thankfully, he got a good job as an engineer and all, but he's got those crushing college debts that a lot of college students have. And he's looking at, well, how many days of vacation do I have I accumulated yet? And right. when am I going to be portable? And so as he started to dream during their courtship, of what it would be like to, uh, to embrace this entrepreneurial lifestyle. That's when your Escaping Shawshank project came mm. along. Mm. And, man, it, it was life-changing for him. Mm. Talk just a little bit more about that whole metaphor. You literally had people gather at Shawshank Prison. They were in that space of a literal prison as you explored their mental prisons. Is that right? Yes, yes. I mean, it, it was powerful and overwhelming for some people uh, because we literally have them go into a cell when they first get there. It's, of course, open. It stays open. But we give them each a letter 
and they need to open that letter and the letter is instructions and the letter describes them to write a letter of their own to their future self saying, I am sitting here in this cell right now and here's what I'm thinking and here's what I'm feeling and here's what these bars feel like right now and here's what these bars represent. And if I don't get out, here's the things that I'm sacrificing in my life. And if I did get out, here's what I would do. So what we're doing is we're really helping them identify for the first time, because I love what uh, Pascal says, all of man's or woman's evil results from their inability to sit quietly in a room by themselves. Because if they did, they would be bored and that boredom would force them to find a more sure way out. So in other words, Pascal before internet, before TV, before cell phones said about his culture, distraction is killing people from being bored. And if they were bored, they would actually want to create a better life. And how poignant are those words, but for today. And so what we do is we literally take away people's distractions. They literally have to get quietly in a room by themselves. And of course, we have fantastic training. Dan and Joanne did a brilliant job. You know, my business partner, David, and I, we taught. But we're helping people first understand what the prison is in their life. Because many times we walk around knowing we're out of alignment, just like a tire on a long trip. We know we're out of alignment. We know we keep veering to the edge, but we're not sure what's out of alignment. And unless we know what it is, we can't get it fixed. Yeah, exactly. That, that is so powerful. And again, ties in directly with what our listeners are excited about, which is coaching, because it is that, that facilitated listening to self through yes. somebody else who's just posing questions and then being with you in those questions. You are doing a lot of listening to self or listening to the spirit stirred within you. Uh, Carrie, I don't know if you've continued to follow up with James since he was with you at that Shawshank yeah, experience. Yeah, we chatted but... this weekend. On, Did uh, you? Yes. Um, I'm starting to refer business to him. So I said, hey, put something together. I have a lot of people that need your services. So he's right now putting together something because I have a lot of business to send his way. Oh, my goodness. Well, he's probably over the moon then right yeah. now. My goodness. Well, that's cool. Well, that was actually the point I was going to make was from that point till now, just less than a year, he is off like a rocket with this mm -hmm. business of his. FreshEyesInc.com. And he's built this small business consultancy. He's helping small business owners integrate their new technologies, especially doing website and shopping cart and mobile service kind of stuff to upgrade their market positions. But again, as excited as I am about that, I'm very aware that, that this is not the norm, much more the norm for many of our listeners and certainly for many of the clients that our coaching listeners are working with is that they feel stuck still in those prisons. So Talk about that. Why do you think so many people remain stuck in addition to not getting quiet and not just listening to what's there, not experiencing that boredom, but why else do they remain stuck then in those day jobs when they know they're dissatisfied, they know they feel stuck, but they just don't make those leaps into the kind of dream jobs and life that they're really longing for? Yeah. I think there's one main reason, and let's just use James as an example. James is more willing to even explore this because, in my opinion, he has less to lose. You see, when you are in a day job, and for, for me, for example, when did I leave my day job? At the age of 35, four years ago. Although I thought about leaving my day job for the last 12 years. So in other words... When baby one came, then baby two came, then baby three came, then came oh, Christian education for the kids, uh, then came mortgage, then came car payment, then came health insurance payments, you know, all that stuff. When you begin to stack all those things up, those are like bars. And the more you have to lose, the less likely you are to try anything. And so for me, guess who, guess who came to me. And by the way, it was a great departure. I was a pastor for 12 years. I loved a lot of my job, but there were portions of it that were killing me. And the main thing, meetings. Okay, <laughs> A pastor's job, especially a few days a week, is one meeting. Okay, And you take a lunch break while you're eating in your <laughs> meeting. But it was just meeting after meeting after meeting. 
now I look back and say, oh my gosh, I'm totally an entrepreneur. Uh, my dad was a church planner. I look back now and I see, oh, I had entrepreneurial bent, but I never thought about business. I mean, I grew up thinking money was almost wrong. Um, how dare you make an income on what you're passionate about? I, I dabbled with being a full-time missionary, uh, at least for the first two years of Bible Institute, um, right out of college. So in my theology, it was God wants you to go to the deepest, darkest, hardest spots, and that's what life is. Uh, does that sound familiar to anybody? I don't know. <laughs> Yet somehow here you are on the other side of the bars yes. and away from the bars. So what shift took place either externally or internally or maybe both? Yeah. I'll tell you what shifted, and that was that it was an external situation. It, believe it or not, you'll love this. It was a coach. It was a coach. Oh, I do love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, I'm telling you, us coaches need coaches, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a gentleman named Chet Scott of builttolead.com. And, and here's what Chet said. He said, every Friday, I'll coach you. And he coached me over the years. And from his coaching, he confronted a lot of stuff in me. And uh, Because why? I had just gotten off self-injury, okay, even as a pastor. Um, it was an imposter syndrome. It was, hey, you know, nobody can know about this type of thing. And so Chet began to coach me over the years. Then came book one, then came doctorate, then came book two, book three, book four. Finally, Chet calls me one day and he says, I'm looking online. Looks like you're doing great stuff. Yep. Are you happy? Yep. Is your wife happy? Yep. Is God happy? And I was like, you know, quiet crickets. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, I began to give him a line. Okay. And Chet's the type of coach where he smells that. He smells fear. He smells whatever, deceit, self-deceit, he was laying into me, like hard. Wow. Oh, yeah, hard coaching. And basically, the bottom line was that the church asked me to be the um, successor. And I didn't want to be the successor because they said, will you be the successor and you'll get it in 10 years because the founder is still there. So think about this. For any of your listeners today, maybe they're in a situation where they see the ladder and they see what could be if they stayed. And for me, it was a life where I would have had to compromise a lot of my passion, my belief, my best years. And so I thought about it, prayed about it, and went back to them and said, no, but I don't have a fallback plan. And I'll tell you what, Chris and Kim, that was a wake-up call. That was the pain I needed to realize if they say you're out because I didn't take the promotion, I'm out and I got nothing. And I got three kids and a wife <laughs> and a mortgage. So what, what it began starting in my mind was a clock that said I better come up with an escape plan. It sounds like in a sense you were forced or gently led by your coach, or maybe right. not even gently led by your called coach. Called out. Yes, called out towards this movement. Yet in your book, you argue that there's really no better time in history for people to escape their day job, to go to their dream job, than there is right now. So what is it about these times that really makes it a good time in so many ways for our listeners? I love the word side hustle. My first book came out in 2004, then the next one in 2006, and then seven, and then 10, and then 12. In other words, I had a side business, and most people today can actually do a side business, whether it's MLM, uh, whether it's just, look, we just talked about James, but if, if you get a website, you can take on business. And here's what I would challenge your listeners. What if at least three people asked them how to do? Because when, when at least three people have asked you how to do something, it automatically says that there is A, a need, B, a perception. They're not going to ask you unless they think that you can answer their question. So what does this mean? This could be interior design. Someone walks in, oh my gosh, look at your, look at your house. You design you're amazing. How do you do that? What if at least three people asked you how to, how to do something? Today, you don't need massive startup costs 
like you needed years ago. What's your portfolio show? If your portfolio shows that you've accomplished a few things with a few clients and have a few testimonials, you need PayPal. I mean, you need your phone to have a square where you can swipe a credit card. There, today's tech, we're on the phone or we're on Skype. I don't even know what we're on. We're on Skype. Um, you know, tomorrow night, I'm going to jump on with 250 authors and coach them on how to write, publish, and market their books. I've never met most of these people. They're going to be in six different continents, two dozen countries. Wednesday, I have a webinar. Like, in other words, if you have a smartphone, you have more technology than NASA had during the space race. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, and, and it just goes beyond that. I'm thinking of Seth Godin's comments here just recently that, you know, wake up, Amer wake up America, wake up the world. You own a publishing house. Every yes. single person who has, as you said, a, a cell phone yes. there, a laptop, a desktop. The technology we have, we have media companies, we have broadcasting studios. Here we are, all three of us sitting here with our radio quality microphones in our homes. If, if people are watching us on, on YouTube, they can see that, that the background setting there is, oh, yeah, that's, that's Kim and Carrie and Chris's yes. homes. But here we are broadcasting around the world. The technologies that are available to operationalize whatever realizations a person hears as they begin to finally get quiet, listen, coach, and call forth those things that are in there. Man, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There has never been a better time then to grab hold of those things and start to give them, give them feet, get them going somewhere. So actually, let's pull back to your book then, because in your book, you provide a whole lot more than just a kind of a wake-up call about oh, these yeah. realities. Your book lays out a nine-step process to operationalize the pursuit of our dream jobs. So I know we can't go through all nine, but can you walk us through maybe at least those first few steps? Sure. So yeah, the book is really broken down into three, three parts. The three parts are prison, which we've already talked about, and I go massive deep into how most of us are actually imprisoned because we don't have freedom, finances, and fulfillment, and we have prison-like situations. What you're talking about now is the other P, which is the plan, and then we talk about the third part in the book called the payoff. So it's prison, plan, payoff, just like Shawshank Redemption. Um, Tim Robbins was stuck in prison. He, c he came up with a plan and then he experienced the payoff in Zihuataneo with Morgan Freeman. So yes, step one in the book is design your story. And I talk about in that section, your GPS dictates your destination. You actually read my GPS, Chris. I've used that GPS in corporate America when I'm speaking to a large room of people. I've used it one-on-one -on -one clients. I've used it in churches. My GPS is my guru positioning story, my GPS. And everybody on this show today, they have a GPS. But most people do not, they downplay their own story. They think, what's so special about me? I've never had something crazy happen. I... I I have all four limbs. You know, they just say things that make them discount their own guru like ability. But here's the thing they're clear about what their story isn't, they're yeah. not clear and claiming what their story is. And I think the best coaches are people who know themselves. In other words, you can't take people where you haven't gone yourself. So you shared my GPS, a very abbreviated version. But from that, people learned, oh, this guy struggled with stuttering. Oh, this guy actually self-injured. He struggled with depression. You began to see this GPS that says this guy didn't just arrive. This guy just didn't come with a bunch of stuff given to him. He actually had a struggle. And so everyone's GPS is essentially a hero's journey story. But, for example, do you guys remember um, Biggest Loser with uh, that one gal... Jillian Michaels. I don't know if you've ever seen the show or whatever. Mm, the but, exercise guru yeah, now. Yeah. yeah, but I can pick her GPS. I can pick, you mentioned, I think, John Maxwell. I can pick John Maxwell's GPS. But let's just go to Jillian for a moment. Jillian was a adolescent who came from a tough background. She was overweight, very short. People made fun of her. She was called Muffin Top and all these other things. She ran from the child's, uh, I'm sorry, she ran from the cafeteria, hid 
in the library, what happens? Finds martial arts, finds pleasure in that discipline, begins to open gyms, is discovered, and guess what? Now ties her guru positioning story to a million, multi-million dollar brand. You, you see what I'm talking about? Absolutely. What I we, love about yeah. that is the fact that our obstacles, our struggles, the things that people are often embarrassed of, yes. what you're saying are these are the very things that qualify us and equip us and make us who we are. Instead of that mindset that says, these hold me back, these prevent me, they're actually stepping stones to where God wants us to be right now. Totally love that, Kim. Basically, I say it like this. The area of your deepest wound is often the area of your biggest contribution. You, you look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, what qualified him? I mean, the guy who wrote more than half the New Testament. Guess what? I used to kill Christians. And he's not bashful about it. He actually says, this is why I am the poster boy of grace. So I am so with you that many times we hide in our coaching, we hide all over the place online. We put up this mask, we put up this front, even though we know better. And that actually repels people because they think, I could never be as polished. I could never be as perfect. I always share, even briefly, the story of me actually struggling with self-injury because I had so much self-hatred and uh, just issues with, with God about not being perfect. And when people hear that, they're like, oh, well, I'm not as messed up as that guy, so I'm going to hire him or I'm going to work with him or he doesn't think he's all that. You see what I'm saying? Man, and God bless you for being so honest and transparent and allowing the Lord to prove his strength in our weaknesses, right? Oh, yeah. It's Definitely. a beautiful thing. So, so let me move you along because that, that sure. is the, the first piece of your nine-step plan is exploring your story, embracing your story. You say design your story, but then you yep. move to design your space. Talk yep. about that. Exactly. Um, design your space is all about, look, if we met on the airplane, Kim or Chris, and I'm sitting next to you, the space that I give off is the frequency I give off. Because if I sit next to you and say, oh, you know, how you guys doing? And uh, begin chatting with you and immediately out of my mouth is, you know, those guys in Washington, blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, I would begin to inject into you the space of, I call it bed, blame, excuses, and denial. Bed, blame, excuses, mm -hmm. and denial. You would begin to hear very much, oh, this guy's probably just tuned into regular old mass media. He's regurgitating the latest news feed. He's uh, discouraged about other external factors that are slowing down his life. In other words, he's not a guy who's a victor, someone who takes ownership, accountability, and responsibility for their life. So space is everything. You can go on a, my website, carryoverburner.com, and immediately you will pick up the space of... Um, it, it, possibilities, um, souls on fire, uh, wanting to have more. By the way, we're all on computers. Do you, are you guys? You guys know about Apple, Apple Store, right? Uh, right? We've, we've uh, heard yeah. of it. We're actually okay. on okay. Apple computers, both of us. <laughs> so, so let's just take Apple for a moment. Let's just take the space of Apple. So people have spaces, websites have spaces, businesses have spaces. But let me ask you a question: When you walk into an Apple Store, are the employees all dressed you know, in uh, their own types of garb? Are they all wearing whatever they want? Yeah. No, I love going to an Apple store. They're all That's in so their, cool. I know exactly what they wear. <laughs> They're in their blue <laughs> shirts and their black pants, and they've yeah. got the latest iPad in their hands that I really want to own if I just had enough money to buy it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there stuff on the wall, like Applebee's, like knickknacks and all kinds of stuff on the wall? I mean, do you see, do you see the walls cluttered with um, no. all kinds of stuff? They're very clean, everything. Very, clean. very yeah. clean. In other words, everything about Apple reflects their values. Steve Jobs was not about clutter. Steve Jobs was about crisp, clean user interface. They even have iPads on the ground on a small table so my three kids can play with them while I go you know, to the Genius mm -hmm. Bar. Everything about Apple, even if you buy something, they reach under the table, whoosh, pull out a little bag. 
They don't even store their bags except underneath the table where no one de- nobody sees. Here's the point. Uh, your space reflects your values. My space reflects my values. And so every one of us is the CEO of a cool little company called YOU. Okay? Every one of us is the CEO of our own company. And if we are not managing our 20 square feet of space well, the world looks at us and says, gee, confusion repels, clarity attracts. Everybody needs a clear space. And let me just say this and then we can move on. But most of your coaches are on social media. I, I imagine, even if it's what, whatever, LinkedIn, Twitter, this type of thing. Most mistakes that I see when I coach people is a space that's confusing. Think of yourself. We talked about it. We each are our own radio station, our own TV station. If you turned on the radio station, your favorite one, and in the morning you heard rap, in the afternoon you heard opera, then you heard talk show, then you heard sports radio, what would you do with that channel? Yeah. Oh, well, I would turn it off. (laughs) And yet most people view their social media in that way. In the morning, I post about my orange juice. Then I talk about a thought of the day. Then I rant and rave that I didn't get my food fast enough. In other words, we we talked about advantages of today's world, but there are disadvantages, which, which means you need alignment. And one of the things I coach people on very, very quickly is your space needs to be aligned. I know we want to move on to at least step three, but I do want to just rewind. So take what you just said and take the new embracing his space, Carrie, and sit down in the airplane seat next to me. How are you going to start that conversation? Here's what you'd pick up, Kim. You'd pick up selling and marketing. And let me redefine it. Serving and storytelling. Selling is serving. Most times when I meet coaches, they can't close people. They can't because it feels yucky. It feels like they shift. No, 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 no. Everything I do, selling is serving. Selling is serving. So I pick up clients anywhere I go. I'm literally talking about on the playground when a guy's pushing, true story, his daughter on a swing, I'm pushing my daughter on a swing. Here's how I started that conversation. Beautiful day, isn't it? And the guy starts talking to me and he says, oh, you know, I just... I snuck away from work today. Really? Why would you have to sneak away? It's a true story. Why would you have to sneak away from work today? Oh, I just, I hate my job. I just, I got zero time with my family. I'm here. I snuck away. I'm pushing my daughter. Guess what? 25 minutes later, the guy says to me, I've been talking a lot. What do you do? Oh, I actually <laughs> coach. And then he says, what is coaching? I've been doing it the last 25 minutes. Yeah. Really? What does it mean? To, what, what would it mean to, to work with you? I mean, I'm a true story. So yeah. in other words, here's, here's my phrase. Show up filled up. Show up filled up. You don't go to the airport and sit next to your seat empty. Because if you do, you will not give value to other people. You convert and sell people when you add value to their life. You only add value to their life if you show up filled up. Most people are so in tune with their own story, they're not even aware of the person next to them. And that's why they miss it. They always miss these opportunities to, quote, serve people. And again, I define selling as serving. Yeah, so I I love that you have actually pulled in the third of those first three steps there because you just hit the third S there, service. You've moved from our story to our space to our service. Mm-hmm. So ex- I, I guess basically that does sum it up. You, you want to be consciously aware of what services you have to offer so that when you are in relationship conversation with anyone and you're intentionally using your space, you're being true to those core values that you have. You're honoring who you are and what you're about, and you're going to be catching I guess, the space of the other people. You're, you're on their same wavelength. You're hearing where the need is and where there's opportunity to serve. And like you said, then you plug in that service and that story. That's your sales. That's your marketing. Women are very good at this, much better than men. But women will often say, that guy is giving me a bad vibe. They're well aware that everyone's giving off a frequency. And when you give off a frequency that's attractive to the potential client in front of you, they say, I want more of that space. You bring up a great point, Chris, which is your service. We call this your VPS. I just want to challenge your your listeners right now. Right now, they can jot this down. They can do what I call the drive-through drill. The drive-through drill just means that if people pull up to your metaphor 
drive through window and they say, hey, Chris, hey, Kim, so-and-so told me about you, uh, that I should work with you, or you know, I really resonate with what you're saying. How can I work with you? Most people have zero clue about what their VPS is, their value proposition statement. It's very simple. It's just, I am blank, who helps blank, do or understand blank, so that blank. I am blank, who helps blank, do or understand blank, so that blank. And my VPS, really quick, I am an author, coach, and speaker who helps individuals and organizations clarify who they are, why they're here, and where they're going so they can become a soul on fire and share their message with the world. That's what I tell people after they're lean, leaning in. It's not You don't lead with your VPS, your service. Hey, how can I be of service? You lead with your story. Lead, you lead with your space. Then when people are leaning in, then you begin to tell them after they ask, here's what my service is. Yeah, beautiful. And when you think about what your service is, so taking it just another step further, I know that you encourage people to diversify and have multiple streams of income, not necessarily just one service. Could you talk about that a little? So kind of what, there's a lot of things I don't do well in the world, singing, musical instruments, a whole bunch of things I could go on forever. But what I'm really good at is helping people, especially take their book and bundle products and services around it. And so I often teach people the 18 different streams of income that they can create around their book. This is very different when coaches hear this in the beginning because coaches think, oh, my main product is me and my main service is coaching. And I say, hold on. What if your main book was, what if your main uh, product was your, your book? Your book represents you. Your book, your book is not a business card. I've heard this so many times. My book is a business card. No, it's not. Business cards don't change lives. Books do. Books change lives. So if you can take your book, which is day job to dream job, and then guess what? James, who's Chris's son-in-law, came to one of my streams of income, which was an immersion experience around my book that actually resulted from day job to dream job. I have keynotes around every book. I have masterminds around every book. I have self-serve coaching programs around the book. I have live coaching programs around the book. So in other words, what I really want to challenge people to do is today it's easier than ever to get published. And if you think about it correctly, you're not building a $16 business card. You're, build, you're building a six-figure business and it all flows from your book. Man, I love that. I love that. So much of what Kim and I are about here is calling out the Christian world into this field of coaching, whether just integrating it in their places of employment, ministry, business, whatever, and or getting that side gig thing going there. Starting a private practice, maybe just for supplemental income now, but maybe something you transition into over time to avoid burnout or to prepare for semi-retirement or free up time with the grandkids or whatever. And of course, we always tune into the coaching side of the equation. That's where we're going to develop that that service and those skills. And we always emphasize you want to diversify those streams of income. And I couldn't agree with you more. There's there's nothing that a person can produce or or package that is as powerful in terms of its drawing impact and as you say, all the other spin-offs that you can do with it as a book is. So spot on there. Well, Carrie, I'm aware of our time, so we're going to start to bring this plane into land. But you close out your book by briefly referencing a conversation you had with, you mentioned John Maxwell there a moment ago. You were conversing with him, I guess he was one of your mentors, right? Or is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. About um, how you can know when it's the right time to leave mm -hmm. your day job. And you listed things like when we've fulfilled our calling right. in that position or when we're being pulled toward improvement, just a, just a new season, mm -hmm. or when we're embracing a new assignment, something's got us really fired up. When we have reached our potential, you kind of sense that you're banging your head on some built-in glass ceiling, or even when you've learned as much as you can from the people around you, kind of kind of getting stale there. But some final words of advice, some wrap-up points maybe that you would leave with our coaches who are either already seriously considering their transition from day job to dream job or have already made it, they're working with clients, and their clients are struggling with this transition from day job to dream job. Number one, I believe in them. 
they would not be listening to a fantastic podcast like you and Kim have built if they weren't already a winner. And I seriously mean that. Look, dead people feel nothing, okay? Dead people feel nothing last time I checked. The, 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 the whole point that they're on this podcast, they're interested they're leaning in, they're trying to figure it out, says volumes about them. While other people are going playing Pokemon or reality TV or eating potato chips on the couch, they're actually thinking and feeling. Now I want to say convert that into action. You need to start before you're ready. You need to market before you manufacture. And that's actually one of the steps. Market before you manufacture. You don't need a crazy five-figure website with all kinds of bells and whistles. You don't. That's actually distracting and it is you hiding. Okay? We all can hide and I hid for plenty of years and quote made myself look busy. Start your dream. It's getting out and chatting with people. It's instead of you getting and taking from conversations at the next networking event, at the next party, mixer, Christmas party, whatever. I've I've gotten clients at all of those and it's because magic phrase, show up, filled up. You do the work ahead of time in the morning. You spend time with the Lord. You get a strong core. And then suddenly you look around and everybody has needs that need to be filled. And a lot of these people want to work with you. Gary, thank you so much for being here today, for your enthusiasm, your sincerity, the authenticity of being what you say, you know, you live what you believe. We appreciate it. You mentioned 18 different streams of income. You mentioned several programs and ways that you serve different people. Could you just, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how could they go about doing that? Yeah, fantastic. My passion is really within coaching to do author coaching. I love to see people's stories in print. I'm a six-time traditionally published author, but I got rejected so much in the process. 12 years ago when I started, it was very difficult to break into this market. Now what I love to do is teach people how to write and publish and market their books and turn those into six-figure businesses. So what I've done is I've created a free training. Over 35,000 people have actually watched this training and it's gold. By the time you watch that, you will know more than 95% of the publishing industry experts. I go over self-publishing, traditional publishing. How can you get readers if you don't have a big platform? How can you turn your book into 18 streams of income? And we've created, a, I think, a special link and I'm going to give that to your audience free. And um, there's no click to buy on the webinar. This is just pure value. There's a workbook with it. And uh, I think they can access it 24-7 because we're going to make it available in that way. Well, that's exactly right. And there is a special link for that. So if that's piqued your interest, all you need to do is jump on the web and go to professionalchristiancoachingtoday.com forward slash author. It's that simple. Professionalchristiancoachingtoday.com forward slash author. And you will be able to access that free 90-minute webinar, the workbook that goes with it. And man, you can open up a whole new world, I got a hunch, uh, through that doorway. Thanks, Kerry. That, that's a very generous offer for our listeners. Thank you. No problem. I'm, I'm thrilled what you guys are doing. Thank you, Chris and Kim, for all the ways that you're creating um, paths of light and kicking back the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Well, for all of you, until next time, keep raising that standard of coaching and changing the world. God's richest blessings to you. 